Good morning. How are you all doing? Yeah. I have a great time. I went to swim last night. That's my habit every night. So I have a wonderful time. Met with people in the pool uh, from USC, uh, from other part of uh, the country. I'm so pleased to introduce the, today's key, keynote uh, speaker for the closing. Uh, I'm Professor Patrick Leon from the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. I've been in Houston for almost uh, 23 years, uh, from Hawaii, Denver, Ohio, Louisiana, uh, finally settled down in Texas. I forgot Iowa. I was in Iowa too. So anyway, it's a joy for me to introduce uh, Alvin Sali. And uh, when I read his um, uh, introduction, I was so impressed. <laughs> So I compare him with myself. I will tell you what the, this is a very unique introduction. Okay. Um, Alvin is currently on the UTMB President's uh, Cabinet. Uh, I don't know where I am. Okay. I am on the cabinet. Okay. And also, he has a uh, family practice with children and developmental delays. So I, my practice uh, is medical, okay? So he reflected that my weaknesses there. <laughs> Thirdly is that uh, he began teaching at Texas State University in 1974. I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, was director of school of social work, New Mexico State University from 1976 to 1994. Well, actually I just uh, started getting college. And also, he uh, is the first four-year contract in USA Professor Emeritus. I am not thinking about this until 30 years later. <laughs> he uh, was the director of the Family Restoration Institute from 1975 to 2009. Well, I was on the way from Hong Kong to Ohio, earning my MSW and PhD, and then uh, later on, those years went to teach in Denver, as well as in Iowa, Hawaii, and then uh, set up in Texas. So I'm still working very hard. I really admire what he is doing. He is UHD, Tang Tang, Director of Center for Family Strength from 2010 to 2013, and then retired. And I'm still wondering uh, <coughs> my director as the International uh, Office for Edu International Education in University of Houston. So he served on multiple board of directors. I'm very impressed. And uh, he also served as the National Association of Dean and Director, Future of Social Work Committee, Associate of Social Work Boards, uh, Exam Committee, New Mexico State, uh, Licensing Board Chair, New Mexico Dental Board of Public uh, uh, member. Also, uh, he offered over 50 grand, my goodness, with 15 million. I'm not even get that, okay? Uh, over 50 articles and report, eight books, and edited two journals. I would have two books, okay? So I work 30 more years more to get three books, okay? And he consulted with over 30 universities and States on 4E and child welfare. And then he uh, have 40 uh, 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 expert witnesses uh, uh, testimony. Wow, well, I'm impressed. Also, I just read the newspaper, May, dated May 17, his picture on it, Galveston Daily News. And uh, he talked about wandering after retirement. He's not wandering. He's raised a lot of social justice questions, read about it. And then, for example, uh, uh, why are we uh, uh, not uh, helping the poor, okay, and giving money to the rich? So that is a very good question. So he's not retiring. Without further introduction, let's welcome uh, our Sali. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that. And boy, you scare me when you start comparing me to you. The wonderful work you've done all over the world. So I really... Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And first of all, I want to apologize to all of the keynote speakers I've had through the years through conferences after a play. Weren't they wonderful? Just great. And uh, now I know what a tough act it is to follow. Um, and I also kind of knew, after I saw them, why the newspaper the other day ran this headline, How to Lose an Audience. 
<laughs> Some of you, uh, I know, may be uh, heading out to the airport, so if you get up and walk out of my speech, I'm not going to take it personally. I'm sure you have to come out and use them. So. Uh, through the years, uh, when I had the privilege of working with Texas State on this conference and other conferences, we always tried to pick a keynote speaker who would be inspirational and motivate us to go out and do the wonderful work that you all do. And we've had wonderful people, Twyla Loss and others, uh, Kathy Breyer Loss, and just very inspirational people. So when um, Noel called and asked me if I would give a speech, I thought in my mind, please don't make it the closing keynote, because that's a really <laughs> tough one. So, then she said to close a keynote, and then she said, by the way, we're going to have this theater company come. Uh, but I, I see so many friends, I won't say old friends, but longtime friends in the audience, so I feel very comfortable. Uh, it's uh, really wonderful to be living in Galveston. If you told me five years ago I'd be retired living in Galveston, Texas, most of you that know me, I would say you're crazy. Uh, I would no way go back and live in Texas with that state's uh, political system and so forth. Child welfare, wonderful. Political system, tough. So I have to correct a little thing in the, the program that says it's Galveston, Texas. In Galveston, we say somewhere near Texas. <laughs> we don't quite claim Texas, but part of the county up by Houston, we have white flight and it's a totally different uh, atmosphere than down here in Dallas. And there's so much history and energy. If you read the newspaper a little bit, uh, you just see uh, from Tea Party to progressive socialists. We have a former professor of socialists that writes for the paper and the UT, uh, University of Texas medical branch, the medical school that writes. So it, there's a lot of energy considering it's a pretty small town. And, and we still go to New Mexico in the summer. For some reason, it's cooler there than uh, in Houston, and there aren't quite as many tourists at our house in Albuquerque in the summer as there are down here on the beach. Um, as I said, the, the closing speech was usually meant to be inspirational. Now, I know that many of you are getting continuing education units, so I'm going to have to spend some time on content. And if I was, uh, if this were a lecture, this would definitely be on the final exam. So I'd have to pay attention a little bit. Um, we lost Carlos. I had my PowerPoints. Okay. You know, for 30 years I taught without PowerPoints. I think we're okay. Um, what, the, the title, we're talking about challenges, inno innovation, and inspiration. And uh, I want to cover some of the challenges and look at kind of a broader world that we live in. And again, the young actors did such a great job of addressing that. And then in terms of innovation, I want to look at some of the wonderful things that have come out of many of the 4E programs and in child welfare that we have available. And then inspiration is what motivates us to do this work, to hassle with the regulations, to do all the tough work that you all do. So those are the three areas I'd like to, to share with you in the few minutes we have. Uh, and, and when I talk about inspiration, uh, I noticed, Patrick taught me a little bit about statistics. When I was walking the dogs on the beach down here this morning at 5.30, it was very inspiring. There was a cloud bank. The sun was just coming up behind the clouds. You could see a few ships out on the horizon. And I looked up at San Luis, and I noticed 14 lights were on in the rooms. Now, I don't know if some people went to sleep with their lights on or not, but I assume they were up. I noticed there were 10 on the condominium side where the Minnesotans are. <laughs> so I'm sure they're up getting, they're, they're so organized, they're getting up getting ready to head out, and there were four on the hotel side, so uh, those were my statistics, Patrick, from this morning. <laughs> so um, when I was preparing for this uh, talk, I just thought, well, I better do some research. I've, I've been gone for a semester from the university, so I went to uh, the review of literature by watching The Daily Show with John Stewart. <laughs> where all my students got their news. And, and, uh, 
And uh, there's, if you go on and look at the clip, there's a clip there with uh, Peter Sch uh, Schlock that is a professor of law at Yale University. He's written a new book. The new book is titled Why Government Fails, and then a very small print, What We Can Do to Improve It. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, I thought he raised some really good issues about the world that we're dealing in. And with 4E, we're dealing with government, whether it's the federal level or the state level. Um, and what has been happening, of course, since 1980, after Reagan was elected, is that the new system, the FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the New Deal, uh, kind of changed the focus of government and made the government you know, much more in tune with the general welfare and looking out for folks that weren't as fortunate. And since 1980, of course, there's been an assault on government, the government's bad, and uh, we need to get rid of it and minimize it. Um, so this new system's been under attack at the federal level, now at the state level, uh, very viciously. And there are a number of reasons. Um, and what, what uh, Professor Schlock did is he looked at a number of studies that have been done on government, everything from morale of workers to efficiency, cost analysis, and so forth. And he kind of came up with some things that are challenges to, uh, that you have to deal with and that make government much weaker and not too effective. I happen to believe that a lot of people who run are against government, but they want to be in government. I think part of their theory is to make government so ineffective. Uh, I, it just gets so mad when you look at the Veterans Administration and the way Obamacare is fault, as many faults as it has, was rolled out, and you think, why can't we do that? So looking at all these studies, he has a number of uh, things that he found. The first is that office holders, policy makers, and fortunately there are more and more social workers and there are more and more women, but not near enough, it's only 10% in the Congress. But office holders have to have fast and quick and simple answers in order to get reelected, And that's what they focus on. And if you deal with your legislators, you probably know that. Uh, they don't want to read a 50-page report. They have to turn the page. They're not going to do it. I used to, one of my toughest assignments for students is you had to do a policy analysis on one page. And you had to have one-inch margins, and you had to have font large enough that I could read it without my <laughs> microscope. And they just struggled with that. They wanted to write 10 pages, but writing one page. But you have to keep in mind that policymakers really uh, need easy, simple answers that can go on 10 seconds uh, on, uh, on the TV news. One time, 60 Minutes interviewed me, and one of our senior faculty was with me, and she said, you know, they're not going to use any of what you said. And I said, oh, I don't know. They really came and recruited me and paid my way over here and everything. And she said, your answers were too long. They were like 30 seconds long. And she was right to use some of the Instead, and gave 10 second answers. So that's one challenge that we face. Another is that policymakers lack adequate information. Uh, there's poor management and there's lack of cooperation. Again, the students nailed it just right. And, with pot, and even though we have wonderful information that people like Patrick and Monique and many of you are compiling. Getting that in the hands of policymakers, getting it where they understand it's a, a really difficult challenge. So they usually are operating based more and more on ideology, not information. <laughs> um, another issue that we face is social engineering. And there are usually far too many agencies involved. You know, again, I don't have to tell you all about that. Anytime you do something, you have so many agencies that are involved that it, it gets very, very complex. It's usually a long process. You know, we have to study things. We have to involve everything. Rulemaking takes forever. Um, social issues are far too complex for policymakers to understand, especially at the state legislature level. 
You know, in New Mexico, uh, our legislators in Texas aren't paid to find people that have the wealth to be able to go to a legislative session in Texas far too long, six months, every two years. New Mexico's 30 days, it's 60 days. But most of these people don't have backgrounds that prepare them to deal with complex social issues. So again, we get very simplistic things like Dr. Sanborn said in the opening, the legislator, I'll tell you where he's from, was the Woodlands, and he said, I really enjoy getting up every morning and fixing breakfast for my kids and send them up to school. Well, that's great. That's not reality for most people. You're filthy rich living in a plain community, and you decide that's policy for all the kids in Texas. And like Bob said, it wasn't until he left office that they finally got it. federally paid for it. It wasn't going to cost Texas a nickel federally paid for lunches. And we know from the research that, of course, kids that don't have breakfast don't do very well in school. Uh, the other issue is that, uh, that Peter found is that there's been an incredible ex expansion of laws and regulations and interpretations. Uh, need I say more than OMB Circular 21A, for you all to know, or penetration rate and so forth. And I'll talk a little bit about how these apply to 40 in just a second. And then finally, the other major issue that he listed in this book is that there's a battle between the legislative branch and the administrative branch. And we certainly see this at the federal level, but we often see it at the state level too, to control the bureaucracy. And as a result, there are a lot of problems. We have a lack of consistent leadership. You know, they want to throw General Consecchi out of the VA. It's been there six years. Okay, they're going to put someone new, and how long is it going to take him to get up to speed and understand a very complex uh, medical system? Uh, we constantly, in child welfare, see a high turnover rate of quality leaders. And, and I, it just always got me like, I remember Mr. Pinion years ago in Oklahoma doing a tremendous job. And then we have these private foundations that come and say, oh, we want to hire you. They take them, they cherry pick all the good child welfare directors out of the states. And I think it's done tremendous harm over the last several years. There's layers of political appointees, and every one of them comes in and uh, they have some agenda. Uh, one of them told me it's to get the governor on the front page of Time Magazine. Okay, that's really going to help abuse kids and families in that state. Uh, another one I overheard on the phone say, well, yeah, I got appointed and she said, I, I don't quite know what the programs are that I'll be over, but I know food stamps is not one of them. Really? That's who we have running these programs. Um, there's very poor pay, and while that's not the reason we got into social work, the, the attracting <coughs> top rate managers and supervisors, you have to have enough money to live on as well. And also, when you look at the bureaucracy in this battle, there's often very little support from line workers. It's like, oh, another one, they'll be out of here in a few months. And I know years ago, uh, the governor brought me up to Santa Fe to help redesign social services with a group of us young group of crusade. I actually had long hair back then. And, uh, <laughs> they had a personnel that was a career bureaucrat met me in the hall one day and he said, you know, you guys think you're going to come in here and innovate and change. He said, we were here before you and we're going to be here after you. Nothing's going to change. And to a large degree, he was right, um, I have to say. A lot of the things in the bureaucracy, the state bureaucracy, they're kind of fun things to do in social work, like adoptions and family preservation, get contracted out to private agencies. They don't so state workers don't get to do that. And of course, we see very low morale uh, in most public sector jobs. Uh, teachers, uh, my, half my family are social workers and half are, are uh, teachers, and teachers get beat up uh, in the media and, uh, and uh, Congress and legislature continually. Uh, they certainly pick and choose who they want to hold up as role models. Firemen are great, teachers are awful. Military are wonderful and great, and social workers are terrible. You begin to see an agenda there. 
Uh, now, a few others that were not in the book, I think, are real important to look at is also that we see in government, and that's incredible racism, sexism, all the isms that Congressman Ron Dellums, who was a social worker, used to talk about, the isms that uh, are now becoming overt when you have uh, a half-white president. I, I don't understand, unless you go back to slavery, uh, that, you know, if you have one drop of uh, black blood, then you were uh, considered a, a black man. But the fact that he was raised in an Anglo family and is half white somehow gets lost on the news and everything else and disrespected. And we see more and more overt racism. And we've certainly seen it in Galveston. Right after I think, first thing they did was pull those, the low income housing projects. And the last mayor and city council, or mostly Tea Party, they campaigned on keep those poor people off the side. And what they meant was keep those black people off the side. You know, we don't have a public swimming pool in Galveston. Santa Fe's the same size. They have seven publicly funded swimming pools, including a gorgeous indoor one. You know, here, the only one, and why I'm on the president's cabinet is because they have a swimming pool at the university. Uh, but you know, the public doesn't have anything. So now they're trying to raise private money to have a public pool in Galveston. And the head of that read one of my newspaper articles and said, I just wanted to let you know we have this effort. And, you know, and I said, yeah, well, I think the reason you don't have one has to do with race. And it's still over. And of course, sexism, I'm looking around the room, I don't need to tell you ladies about that as well. Uh, gay and lesbian and so forth. All those that discrimination seeps into every government program. And very few people stand up and, and and speak against it. Um, the other thing is that people vote against their own self-interest. And you really see it in this community. Uh, I had an Obama sticker on my car when I moved here. And one day in the locker room with all the doctors and rich people in town in the swimming pool, this guy kind of sidles up to me and he said, do you drive a red SUV? And I went, I know what's coming. I said, yes. Said, and it has Obama sticker on it. I thought, okay, here it comes. I said, yes. He said, I think we're the only two white guys in Galveston for uh, Obama. You may have been <laughs> When I go home to New Mexico, everyone has uh, Obama stickers. It's like being in a different world. But it's why do people that are lower, middle class, working poor, buy into this cut government? And then they complain about tuition rates are going up. Well, why do you think it is? You know, all you have to do in this state is look to Austin or look nationally. And it used to be when the white GIs came back from World War II, there was the GI Bill, and you know they went to school almost free. And then there was the National Defense Loan program that uh, teachers could have paid back very quickly. We try to get the we did get the Perkins Loan Program. I don't know how many of you using the Perkins Loan Program for your students. Oops, you need to look into that. If students work in uh, poverty areas after they graduate, they'll repay their loan. We got that through a few years ago. But people vote against their own self-interest. And I think a lot of it has to do with banning fear and people want to associate with those who have power. So those are kind of the macro macro level issues. Uh, also, the moral argument is that, you know, it's okay, we really need to give oil companies $10 billion to subsidize them, but boy, we're really against the minimum wage. That's going to wreck our economy. And it goes on and on. And it's like, well, if you're on Wall Street and you steal people's money, it's okay, we're not going to send you to jail. But we've got to get those welfare sheets, all those people. So there's this incredible imbalance in the moral argument, and it's framed, and it's very subtle, but I think we need to really pay attention to it as well. Now, there have been some government successes. When you look at program Social Security, uh, thank you. I just started. It's great. The GI Bill I mentioned, the interstate highway system, 
I'm not sure about I-45 when you go home, but uh, it's there. Uh, the earned income tax credit. I hope you all are teaching your students about that. It's one of the best welfare programs that's ever been. Voting Rights Act, unfortunately, the Supreme Court's appealing that back. National Institute of Health, uh, Obamacare, Medicare. I mean, there are some real governmental uh, success stories, and they may have a little tweaking that needs to go on as uh, the 10 million of us that retire each year uh, start using those programs, but they are successful. So one, now looking at the challenges in 4E, I hope you've been able to see some of those governmental things we can translate into 4E. You're always re-educating new child welfare directors or a new training director, and you're dealing with a new political appointee and what's their agenda, and they're gonna change everything. Um, the regulations are constantly changing, and, the, and there's no consistent interpretation <coughs> California, some they weren't can weren't they paying eighteen thousand dollars? You all paid stipends, you know. And New Mexico, they cut it back to two thousand. So it's just it's all over the place, and you're always holding your breath if you're going to have to pay it back or not. Um, so we, 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 I know that you all have heard enough about that, and there've been so many good workshops on that at this conference. Um, the cost allocation, matching, and so forth. Uh, as Patrick says, I've consulted with over 30 states and uh, universities from Alaska to Florida, from Vermont to California, and they invited me to come over to, Cal to Hawaii, and I said, well, let's sit down and let's make sure it's worth uh, your while to have you come over. And this was years ago. They were doing a great job of holding down the foster care rate. So I did, I ran the cost allocation, and they would have been getting about 9% federal money. I said, as much as I'd like to come to Hawaii, uh, that's really not enough to have me come over. But uh, uh, Joe Woodard went over there, and they're doing great guns now. So. And uh, the, often the federal programs were set up to actually punish states, so that when you lower foster care rates, Normally, you're going to be losing more money. We're still using the match, the, the poverty rate, 1996, although there are far more poor kids in this country than there were back there. So there are all these little gimmicks that are in place. And one of the broader issues that the rules are not fair. You know, if you are a big oil company or uh, some other uh, organization, the Koch brothers, uh, you know, they say, well, we're, we're putting all our money into ideology. No, you're not. It's about greed. Uh, you're fixing regulations. You're fixing the way the government game is played to benefit your business. And I think ultimately the idea is, of course, totally say fair, no regulations. So if you can't drink the water in West Virginia, tough. We need jobs for coal miners and more profit for the coal brothers. And we see that over and over again. But if you're providing a social service program, you're punished uh, for doing a good job. Uh, all we need, and, and I worked hard, and Dean uh, Colby, when he was president of, of CSW, is we just need to get one sentence and one bill if anything ever passes Congress again. And all it says is that Title IV is not cost of allocated and is to be awarded at 75% federal, 25% state rate. And uh, when Senator Menachi, who was uh, from New Mexico, who had championed mental health, uh, was in the minority, so he sent me over to Senator Rockefeller from West Virginia, and we tried and tried to get that in, and Dean Colby tried, and the lobbyists just said, this, nothing's getting through Congress in the next two or three years, or maybe four years, but just that one sentence would cure a ton of headaches that, that you all are dealing with. Um, well, let me quickly talk about uh, innovations. Uh, there, when I looked at the research, about a third of the states are privatizing child welfare, about a third are using traditional child welfare, the broken system we have, and about a third are front-loading the system. In other words, providing um, good programming for trying to keep families together and so forth, which, of course, again, is not fully eligible. Uh, 
the program, the states that are privatized, has been pretty much abysmal. This week, Nebraska was notified that they, after they privatized their foster care system, they owe the government $22 million in back pay because they failed to document the most simple things they were doing. Any state agency would have documented that. They argue they only owe 17 million. My guess is no one's from here from Nebraska. Yeah, because you owe 17 million. <laughs> But we have the technology. We've had it a long time. But as I was going through cleaning out my files, I found this article that Jim Lloyd and I wrote, I think it was 1993, uh, on family preservation and support services. And I, I had some extra. And if anyone's interested, Patrick has some. If, they, if the states were doing this now, it would be so much better for kids and families. Then I was, another thing I found was this. Uh, children's agenda we drew up for the governor in New Mexico in 93 and uh, just wanted to share with you wouldn't this be wonderful if we had states doing this a strong focus on families and service delivery a the development of a less fragmented system informal user-friendly responses and community service development local flexibility and control universal availability, a commitment to define and measure outcomes, we've done that pretty well, and inclusion and responsiveness to ethnic, cultural, and racial diversity. 1993, we don't have it in this country. So we know how to innovate. You all, the programs you do, we know how to work with families and kids and how to prevent child abuse most cases, how to keep families together in most cases, but for a number of these reasons that we talked about, we're not able to implement the uh, innovations that we have. Um, I think what that means is that if you're directing a 4 e program uh, or your dean or director, that we need to have a much more involvement at the state level and in, in uh, legislative races. Rather than waiting until someone's elected, I think you need to get involved. Of course, you have to be very careful because of the Hatch Act. Senator Hatch was from New Mexico, and uh, we had some real problems back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Teapot Dome affair and so forth. But you can still get involved politically and, and work with legislators. Uh, I know, for example, our son who graduated from Texas State and was well educated taught him everything he needed to know, and, and the unlearned was dad Tom, so he's doing really well. <laughs> but uh, as a social worker, he's the deputy director of our legislative finance committee in New Mexico, which, and every week, he just told me last night, I'm going to consult with Olivia Goldman, as you may have remembered, was the, the uh, Secretary of Department of Health and Human Services under Clinton. So he's, you know, doing a lot of interesting things nationally, but I think as we, and kind of direct more and more students. Uh, Mandy Kimball is uh, the Children at Risk uh, lobbyist, is an MSW from UT, uh, the better will be. So I think that's another innovation. It's not social work per se, but being effective in the political system is important. Um, now if we'll go to uh, inspiration, we're there. Uh, and I did this before the play, but I, it, and you might say, why is social justice an inspiration? Because it gets my blood flowing. One article I wrote for the, the paper was I was wondering about things, and as Patrick says, I was wondering why there's so many churches in Galveston and people are so good at Thanksgiving and Christmas and feeding the poor, but boy, they're against food stamps, they're against public health and so forth. You know, so when you talk about, uh, and so uh, there were a number of, needless to say, newspapers online, uh, one of them referred to me as sadly, S-A-D, sadly, because you're just sad. No, I'm not sad, piss off. <laughs> so it's not about being fat. So when you talk about social justice to me, I find that inspirational. It's like, we know what's right. We know how to treat people, and we don't do it in this country. So uh, that inspires me. 
you all inspire me. Every time I, I used to go out and consult, I was so inspired by the faculty, or even on CSWE site visits, the students. No, it's always the best part of the site visit when we went in and just met with the students and heard all the wonderful things that they were getting from the faculty and their field instructors and so forth. Um, and then also to celebrate at the, the successes that we have before you, I know Patrick and his committee do such a good job of documenting that and statistics, but I think we also need to celebrate it and tell our stories. I know Janice Brown usually comes to these meetings and she was a 4E recipient and now she's the uh, director for the federal government for this federal region. Uh, you know, we need to celebrate that and kind of personalize it and, and celebrate the successes that individuals have and that families have. Uh, well, one of the many things I was taught uh, through my career uh, were family members that came to some of our early uh, family preservation planning committees, and they said, you need to always have a family a family expert, what we call them, they were clients. You always need to have two presenters on every workshop, one who's a family expert, a client, and one who's the professional. And I was, well, this is really for professional. And uh, one woman who used to come and just tell me that and tell me that adult daughter committed suicide. And I saw what strength she had, what insight she had, and how she knew the system better than any of us, the professional social workers, because she used that system. And I found that very inspiring. So we really tried to do that. I was thrilled to see a number of students here. And I know Kim's brought students in the past, and that's inspirational as well. There are so many national leaders that we can look to that have been ins inspirational, too. And so I want to model a little bit for you what I've been talking about in terms of individualizing our successes and stories. And uh, I want to use borrow one from Quila Watts. It's on the internet, so you can look it up. And, and this really is a true story, and it's known as Teddy's story. So I want to uh, end the day a little bit about talking about Teddy's stories. Uh, and it's really the story of an elementary school teacher, but you can see how it would translate to social work very easily. Uh, and her name was Mrs. Thompson. And uh, every time the school year would start, she'd get up and say, uh, you know, I really care uh, about you. And she really lied to the, her student because she said, I love you all and I care about you all. And that we know is impossible. Uh, and the one year, sitting in the front row, slumped down, dressed in dirty clothes, messy, couldn't sit still, and everything, was this young boy named Teddy. He didn't play really well with uh, the other students, and he was pretty unpleasant. And she took great joy in grading his papers and marking F with a big red pen at the top and putting X's through everything. And uh, so after the first few weeks of school, the, all the teachers at the school were required to read the notes about the student, uh, all her students from previous teachers. So she put Teddy's uh, report at the bottom of the pile. She was dreading reading it. So she starts reviewing his file finally. And his first grade teacher wrote, Teddy's a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly, he has excellent manners, he's a joy to be around. Look back at the cover, yeah, it was Teddy's uh, file. Then she read the second grade. Teddy's an excellent student, all the other kids really like him. But he's a little trouble because his mother has a terminal illness, and life at home must be a struggle. Third grade teacher writes, his mother's death has been hard on he tried to do his best, and his father doesn't show much interest. His home life will soon affect how he does in school. By fourth grade, he said, the teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn, doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends, and he sometimes sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized what the problem was, and it was her. She was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse. At Christmas time, when the students brought her presents, 
and Teddy brought her um, a shopping bag, a paper bag, remember those? A paper bag, and in it um, was a bracelet that had some, and it was costume jewelry, and it had some uh, of the, the jewels missing, and a perfume bottle that had just a little in the bottom of the bottle. And the other students started to laugh when she opened Teddy's present, and she got the students to stop laughing. She put the bracelet on. She sprayed the perfume on herself, on her, on her wrist, I guess. And um, that afternoon after school was out, Teddy stayed a minute after class, and he said, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mother used to. After he left, she cried. On that very day, she quit teaching. She stopped teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, and instead she started to teach children. And she paid particular attention to Teddy for the rest of the school year. She worked with him after school, and the more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of her very top uh, students. And a year later, she found another, uh, she found a note on her door after he'd gone on to sixth grade, and it said, you are the best teacher I've ever had in my life. Well, through the years, she would hear from Teddy you know, as he graduated from high school and college. And then one day, uh, she got a, a note from him, and it was signed, Dr. M.D. Uh, Theodore Stoddard. His doctor, it's a, it's a medical doctor. And, but the story didn't end there. A few years later, he contacted her and said, my father passed away and I am going to get married. Would you come and uh, give me away at the wedding because you were the best teacher I ever had. And so she went and she wore that bracelet and she used that perfume. And after the uh, the wedding, uh, Dr. Stoddard whispered into her ear and said, you know, thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you for making me feel important and showing me that I can make a difference in this world. And Mrs. Thompson whispered back to him, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You're the one who taught me how to teach and how to make a difference. And I didn't know how to teach until you taught me how. Um, and Mrs. Thompson was courageous and willing enough to change her perspective. And I know that it's really tough for social workers and faculty members sometimes to change our perspective, but to, to be willing to, to work and see it from uh, the other side of the picture. So I wanted to share with you, just in closing, a little story that, that I had, too. And I know many of you have known me for many years, and I haven't shared this. Uh, I don't know it. Um, my story is that my mother died when I was five years old. And I remember her being wheeled out of the house on a gurney, and then my father sitting down with my brother, who was three at the time. He's gone on. He was a psychologist. He used to always argue which was better social work. <laughs> psychology. And then we started our graduate program at New Mexico State. He was the first one in the door to get his MSW. He's done wonderful work. He also scored the highest on the exam of anyone in the history of the state. He claims because he has a psychology degree. <laughs> my dad sat down with us and told us that you know our mother had gone to heaven. And he worked so hard, he was an engineer, he ran a concrete plant. And so every morning he'd get up at like 4.30, take us over to my Aunt Alice, who was a saint. And uh, then she would put us back to bed, and then we'd get up, I would go to kindergarten, this is winter. And uh, then my dad would come back at dinner time, Aunt Alva would feed us, and then we would go back to our house. Because it was real important to my dad that we stay together, even though he's horrendous hours. The other thing he did is he made sure we went to church. So I had a Sunday school teacher, um, and uh, she was quite exceptional. She was an MBA, 
Uh, she'd gone to Radcliffe, even though know, she was from New Mexico. Um, she was the assistant dean of women. That's back when we had deans of women at the university. She was really into universities and so forth. And I really liked her. She, she had even known uh, my mother had been sorority sisters in college. And uh, so one day, my dad's company was going to have a picnic up in the mountains. So I invited uh, my Sunday school teacher. And she's been my mother for 60 years. She married my dad, you all know, exceptional woman. And one day I told her, I said, I am so sorry you gave up your career. First woman MBA. Mexico to be our mother. She said, I didn't give up anything. I wanted to be your mother. So I know you all see inspiration all the time, but she gave me so much. I couldn't get through this, but I practiced sorry. <laughs> My poor dog was going, huh? <laughs> <laughs> But she loved universities, and when we went on vacation, we went to universities. <laughs> so, you know, so I've been to Charleston and everywhere, you know, in universities. And uh, we went up to the New York World's Fair in 1964, and my dad had to go on naval duty, so she, with four boys, I was the oldest, 14, at age four. She drove in the station wagon a whole month, and we toured all through the South, visiting universities. We'd stay in a motel one night, we'd camp out the next night. Uh, she's an incredible woman. So, she made a huge difference in my life. And I know that Title IV-E and what you do has affected thousands of students and changed their lives as well. And whether you're in a degree program or you're doing training and helping <coughs> workers see things from a new perspective. They're going out and employing skills and working with children and families and changing thousands of lives as well. So in my view, you all are all Mrs. Thompson's and all Carol Salise. You're doing that kind of work. And I'm very proud to be associated with you and, and I really thank you for the work that you Thank you again for the present and for all the wonderful times we've had together and doing this work.